uh, my message is imperfect prophecy. And uh, take this from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. And of course, the Revised Standard Version says it this way. And that's where I got the top, the title. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. Uh, our knowledge is imperfect. We're, we're imperfect humans. And we prophesy out of our imperfection. When God uses the gift of prophecy uh, in this congregation, we prophesy out of our imperfections. We do our best to hear what God is saying, and we share things in uh, regards to uh, the way God speaks to us, our personality, who we are. But it's never perfect. There is nothing in this, uh, this world that is going to be perfect. Jesus Christ was the only perfect uh, thing that walked on the face of the earth. Uh, so it's really important that we understand that this is a gift that God has imparted to the church. And we want to walk in it, we want to embrace it, but we want to uh, see it used properly. Because there are so many abuses out there. All over, you know, you go on in the internet and you can see so many abuses of the gift of prophecy and prophets. There was a prophet in France during the reign of King Louis IV who uh, he predicted the death of one of Louis' advisors eight days before he died. And when Louis found out about this, he decided that this guy was too dangerous to live. So he, he called his royal guard together and um, he, he said, go find this guy. And they went and they found this so-called prophet. And... Uh, they told him that uh, the king wanted an audience with him. So um, this guy was pretty sharp. He knew something was up. And King Louis didn't want this guy alive because he was concerned about some of the things that he might prophesy, as if he was bringing the prophecy to, to pass. But anyhow, the guy came before the king. They grabbed him and Sent, brought him before the king, and when he got before the king, the king said, I have just one question for you. Do you know when you're going to die? This guy was pretty sharp. He said, yes, king, I know when I'm going to die. He said, really? Yes. Well, tell me when, okay? I'm going to die three days before you. <laughs> that was pretty smart, wasn't it? Now, if the king had any idea that this man was truly a prophet, I think that he would have been very concerned about his prophecy and probably wouldn't do any harm to this gentleman. Now, I don't know what, if he really was a prophet or not, who knows? But I can tell you this, the only place that you can find Perfect prophecy is in the Word of God. And the Word of God is perfect down to the, the detail. You know, there was a, a man by the name of Peter Stoner uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. He wrote a book, Science Speaks. And Dr. Stoner was emeritus of science at Westmore College. And Peter Stoner calculated along with 600 students. He had his students do the, some of the calculations and work on this. Uh, he wanted to estimate uh, the major prophecies concerning the, the Messiah and, uh, you know, the, the factors that uh, whether they could have been true or not. The students carefully, they weighed all the factors, discussed each prophecy at, at length, uh, they examined them and made sure that uh, the circumstances which indicated that, uh, that one man would be able to conspire uh, to fulfill any of the prophecies, that that wasn't a possibility. They were very conservative in their estimation. And then Pro uh, Professor Stoner took their estimates and made them even more conservative. He also encouraged uh, skeptics to weigh in on it. And uh, then after he finally came up with all his statistics, he, uh, he had it reviewed by the Committee of the American Science Affiliation. 
And after they examined him, they verified that his calculations were very dependable. They were accurate in regard to the scientific material that was presented. And here's one of the, the prophecies of Micah, uh, chapter 5, verse 2, where it states that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Stoner and his students determined that the average population of Bethlehem at the time and throughout the years, and they divided it, you know, they did all their, he was a mathematician, so they did all their mathematical work. And they concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem was one chance in 300,000. Now, that's pretty incredible. But Dr. Stoner also calculated the possibility of one man fulfilling just eight of the messianic prophecies. And the possibility of that was one in 10 to the 17th power. And what that means is one with 17 zeros after it. The reality is it's almost completely impossible for one man to fulfill just eight of the Messianic prophecies, and there's hundreds of them in the Old Testament. That's how accurate the Word of God is. It's absolutely right on. But we are humans, and we have imperfect knowledge, and nothing that is new for us to recognize that we're imperfect. But you know, even the Messianic prophecies, uh, until they were fulfilled, were kind of a mystery they were debated what, you know, the suffering servant, the, 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 the servant of, of Joseph, uh, the messi, Messiah, Joseph or Messiah, David. You know, people didn't understand, the, the Bible scholars didn't understand the difference between or they thought there might have been a difference between Messiah, Joseph and Messiah, David, uh, Ben David. Uh, so they didn't realize that there was one man that was going to fulfill all these prophecies. So the suffering servant of Jesus Christ, yes, he was a suffering servant, but he's going to come. He's going to return as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to come back as the son of David. Hallelujah. Now, so let's talk about personal prophecy. It, many times, personal prophecy is given in kind of crypt cryptic language or alluded to with visual illusions. Uh, Pastor Otis does that often. Uh, I've heard uh, Ivy, who o operates in the, the um, office uh, of prophetess. Uh, Linda Well, who operates in the office of a, a prophetess. Uh, I've heard them use things like a billy. It's, you know, he's, he, he always sees things. When, uh, when we're praying over people, he, he'll say, you know, here's what I saw. And he'll tell people that he, he sees certain things that, uh, that is alluding to whatever that person is going through. And it speaks volumes to the, to the individual. So God uses these things, but, but he doesn't always speak to us in direct language. His uh, plan is for us to hear what he's saying and seek, press into him, get closer to him to understand what he's uh, trying to say to us and the direction that he wants to, to give us. Prophecy, Joel C. Rosenberg said this about prophecy. Prophecy is an in intercept from the mind and a all, of an all-knowing, an all-seeing, all-powerful God. We're just incept, intercepting pieces and parts here and there because of our frailness as human beings. So let's talk this morning about prophets and prophecy. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, varieties of tongues. The apostle here is talking to the church in Corinth, and he's telling them the different, here's some of the office appointments in the church. The Holy Spirit appoints these people to operate. Now, we have had, in the past, we've had no problems with uh, pastors and teachers, and we talk about them uh, often, but the uh, office of prophet, the office of apostle, 
we kind of lost that for many, many years. We put that aside. And, and we, we forgot that this is a New Testament office that God placed in the church for the benefit, for the building up, for the encouragement of the body of Christ, for teaching. And prophecy and prophets are no different. In Acts chapter 11, now just to verify that this is a New Testament office, Acts chapter 11, chapter 15, chapter 21, it talks about prophets in the church. Verse 27 in Acts chapter 11 said, In those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And then in verse 32 it says, And Judas and Silas being Prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Paul was speaking of Philip the Evangelist in Acts 21 verse 9. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. They were prophetesses who prophesied. And then in verse 10 he goes on to say, And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judah a certain prophet, Named Agabus. Now I'll give you these scriptures because I want to verify in the New Testament. That prophet is a legitimate office that we need to have in the New Testament church today. We need to recognize this. God has not discontinued the office of prophet. Nor has he discontinued the office of apostle. Just like he's not continued to... it discontinued the, the, the uh, position of evangelist and pastor and teacher. These are all part of the New Testament church. Things that need to be in place. It's an important, viable ministry that is much needed in the church today. Now, are there abuses? Absolutely, there's abuses. There's abuses. There's pastors that are abusive. Do we want to throw them out? I mean, throw the the office of pastor out just because there's abuses? No. We want to honor and lift up those who are faithful to the the word of God and serve God. Just like we want to honor the prophets who are faithful. But we have to be careful. In 1988, an evangelical philosopher and Theologian Carl Henry made a a stunning prediction in his book. A prophetic. Because he he was looking at what was happening in in our world. He he said that it was a... We were at the twilight of our great civilization. He said as the American progressives... Continue to grow in in our nation and we progressively lose our Christian heritage, paganism would grow bolder. What we saw in the last half of the 20th century was a kind and benevolent humanism. And I I would say absolutely, that was true. You know, humanism, they talked a lot about love and, and kindness, but it had nothing to do with God. But he predicted that by the start of the 21st century, where we are right now, America would face a situation that unlike the first century when the Christian faith would be confronted with raw paganism, humanism with the pretty face ripped off, revealing the angry monster underneath. His words, I believe, have come true and are coming true right now. We are seeing the angry monster of humanism. And it's in the face of the church. Question is, how do we deal with it? We must deal with it with the love of Jesus Christ. We must deal with it with the supernatural gifts of God. We cannot deal with it with our flesh. We must pray. We must seek the Lord. And we must walk in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be times when we're offended. There's going to be times when we're oppressed. There's going to be times where we're actually persecuted. 
How will we operate? We must hold fast to the love of Christ. No matter what comes our way. That's how we'll deal with it. And God will move in supernatural ways. Ways that we cannot even imagine. God's supernatural ministries are needed in the church today. Like no other time in history. Let's talk about the gift of prophecy. Now that was the office of prophet. The gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 5 through 10. I'm going to give you a moment to look at that. Get your Bible out. Your device. Whatever it is that you have your scriptures on. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 5 through 10. Because we're going to talk about the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 12 5. These are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. What does it say there? The manifestation of the Spirit. Now remember, the gift is the Holy Spirit. The manifestation of the gifts is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives, in our church and in our, our individual lives. So the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one as a Spirit through the same Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. To another, for one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretations of tongues. So, within this, these gifts that are to be operating, Paul is giving the, the local church, the Corinthian church, guidelines for the operation of the supernatural gifts in the body of Christ, in the church. And he intended for God, for the church uh, not only Corinthian church, but the other churches to read these things and operate according to his guidelines. Miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, both of good and evil spirits. Sometimes we discern spirits and we always see demons behind every door. Demonic forces in every situation. Well, listen, the spiritual power of God is much greater than that of the enemy. We should be seeing angels and the power of God moving, overcoming the spirits of, of demonic. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. The Holy Spirit distributes these gifts as he wills in the congregation as we come together people can operate in different gifts at different times as the spirit of God comes up on them and that gives them utterance to do so but the reality is people operate many times in some of the same gifts and let me give you a key to that because Romans chapter 12 verse 6 says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. We all have different gifts given to the, us by the grace of God. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. So we can see that many, the reason that some people are used in the gift of prophecy and the other gifts more often than others is because they have faith to operate in that gift. It's all about faith. The whole, this whole thing in Jesus Christ is all about faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. It's all about faithfully trusting him. So when you have faith to operate in prophecy, you're going to operate in that gift more often. If you have faith to operate in healing, you're op you have faith to operate in any of the gifts, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, those things, you have the faith, so it's going to stir up inside of you. Everyone can have faith to operate in the gifts and in prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14, 31 says, For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. You see, New Testament prophecy and prophets are given to the church not 
for definitive direction in your life. Listen, it's very important that we recognize that God is not going to speak a word into your life every day. He's not going to give you a prophecy or have a prophet speak to you every day to tell you what direction you're going to, to go in. The word of God is sufficient for that. Listen to the word of God. But what he does do is he confirms what he's placed in your heart through prophecy and prophets. Something that God has placed there. Something that God is speaking to you. A prophet will come along and speak to you and confirm that. A prophecy will take place in the congregation and God will confirm what he's speaking to you. Do not rely on prophets and prophecies. To direct your life. But listen to what God is saying. Somewhere around 1999 or 2000. Um, I don't have the exact date. But we. This church was not Bethel at that time. We were South Bethel New Testament Church. Two miles back on the hill. At, uh, across from Eastern High School. Silver Ridge. Little country church. The church was growing, things were changing, and God was moving, and we were trying to discern God's direction. Uh, we were trying to figure out whether God wanted us to build there on the hill, or we, you know, whether he wanted us to move, uh, and we were just trying to hear from God. And what we didn't know at that time, we found out later, but there was people that were actively opposed to the growth of the church. Now, I, I want to make sure I... I make this very clear. There were some people that stayed behind they, in that church. Uh, they, that was a family church. They, you know, they wanted to stay with their traditions. Uh, and it was not those people that we're talking about. We had some people that were actively trying to stop the growth of the church. So I want to make sure I've got, I've got this clear with people. We didn't know it at the time. But they were actively trying to oppose what we felt God was doing. And one of the ladies in our church was driving up Route 7. I think she was on her way to work. And she saw a vision. She, it was so clear to her that she had to pull off the side of the road. And what she saw was a person with a broom outside of that little country church Sweeping, sweeping that church. And dust was flying everywhere. It was just dust. She, had, she said that she could she should get a, a, a glimpse of the person in the midst of the dust from time to time, sweeping and sweeping. Well, you know, what did that mean? What was God saying to us about that? We didn't know. But we went. But here's what prophecy or visions or the supernatural is all about. God speaks to you and he expects you to do your best to search it. He expects us to be Bereans, to search the scripture and to find out what he's saying to us. So what we did was we went to the word of God. Now, I got to warn you, this was not a pleasant thing. But we went to the word of God and we found one place where the word that is transliteral, the transliteration of the, the, the Hebrew word, basom, and basom is an old English word that was used, and I guess it's sometimes still used, for broom. And what we found out was that God was speaking in this particular scripture in Isaiah 14, 23, the only place where this word is used, God was speaking to Babylon. But we also believe that he was speaking something to those people who were trying to oppose the things that God was doing. Now, let me make sure before I read this scripture, we do not, we were not praying for God's harm to come on anybody. We did not, we all we wanted to do was do God's, perform God's will and accomplish God's will. 
But this is what he spoke to us. I will also make it a possession for the porcupine and marshes of muddy water. I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. God was speaking directly to some people that were in opposition to his will. Now, I don't revel in this. I'm not trying to tell you that I was glad that God was speaking that. No. Things that happened to some of these people, I hate. But I can tell you this. God's supernatural gifts are for today, and he speaks to people, and this was a warning to those people. And they wouldn't heed it. God is still speaking through his gifts today. Number two, my point, my second point is, do not treat prophecy with contempt. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 through 20 says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Everything give thanks, even those things that you don't like. Thank God that he's in control. You don't have to thank him for the situation. You thank him that he's in control. Do not quench the spirit. And do not despise prophecy. Now, I took my um, topic here from the NIV translation because it literally says, do not treat prophecy with contempt. And contempt is disdain, dislike, disrespect. And there's a lot of people that are treating prophecy with disdain, dislike, and disrespect in the church today. Rightfully so, I recognize that there's lots of abuses and I will continue to say that. I know people are abusing this gift. They're abusing the office. But we must not throw out the gift because there's just a group of people that's misusing it. We don't want to shut down the churches because there's churches that are abusing and misusing people. Come on. Let God be God. One group says that prophets and personal prophecy is not for today. I don't know where they get that. If you read the New Testament, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, they say, well, because... When the Bible was complete, when we got the complete canon, we no longer need prophecy and prophets. I disagree. Others rely on words to direct their life. I've already made mention of that, but listen, you can go online and find prophets, prophetic hotlines, prophetic readings intended to do just right, just that, direct your life. Every day. And if you're not careful, you'll get caught up in someone else leading you by the nose in the wrong direction. These people are giving prophetic readings just like the psychic hotlines. They're comparable to psychic hotlines. Be careful of those things. They use, as we see the use of the concept of personal prophecy, sometimes they're using it for gain. They're using it to make money. If anybody says, you know, they, they'll uh, give you a, a prophetic word, all you have to do is send in uh, a donation, stray away from those people, run away from those people. You don't need to pay for a word from God. God does not charge for his words. It's a blatant distortion of the biblical gift of prophecy and prophets. It's been going on since the beginning. In Acts, you know, since the beginning of the church, in Acts chapter 8, Philip the evangelist, he preached Christ in Samaria. And people received Jesus Christ as a personal savior, including a man who was a sorcerer, Simon, the sorcerer. Later on, Peter came and laid hands on people, and people received the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
Awesome. You read that in Acts chapter 8. And during that time, Simon exposed his true motivation for receiving Christ. Because he tried to buy the gift. His motivation was he thought that this power was going to make him somebody even more special. Because you see, prior to people... To Peter, or prior to, to the evangelist coming and preaching Christ, that whole place looked to Simon as if he was God himself. And he didn't like losing that power. But his motivation was exposed. And here's what Peter says to him Acts chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for the heart is not, your heart is not right in the sight of God. He exposed his heart. People's hearts are exposed. All you got to do is watch and see the things that they're prophesying, the way they're handling themselves, their life, conducting these prophetic utterances. Be careful what you allow into your life. In the 1980s, there was a gentleman by the name of Peter Popoff. Anybody in here remember Peter Popoff? Okay. Several of you do. Yes, he is. You're right. It's incredible that he is. He was a German-born American. He was a televangelist. And he claimed that he could hear from God. He would have huge uh, revivals, meetings, and people would come in. And part of what they did when they came in, would they, they had a sign up, they had a card, and they'd fill out their name, their address, their phone number, and if they had an ailment. And uh, they would, you know, they said they Basically, they were gathering this information uh, to, to help the people. Well, Popoff claimed that he could tell people their address, their phone number, and things about their life. And he would do it in the service. Well, later they found out, just to, uh, uh, in, I, I can't remember the exact date, maybe uh, 96, something like that. Uh, they found out that what was happening was his wife was on the other end of an earbud with a microphone telling him what about these people that he was talking to. He'd ask their name, they'd tell him his name, and then he would tell them everything about them because she had the information. He would even tell them their ailment and then pray for them for their healing. My God. I, I can't believe people are so bold to do things like that in the face of God. And yet, he was found out. <laughs> he, be, he was bankrupt. And just a couple years later, he was back on the scene doing basically some of the same things he was doing before. He, uh, he bought TV time infomercials and promoted said that he was a prophet and started promoting holy water that would if you bought it you would become wealthy financial independence through his holy water and he sold millions of dollars worth of holy water why is the body of christ so ignorant to allow people to do these things to us why can't we see what the enemy is doing and how he's manipulating and controlling people. I know there are people out there that are so desperate. They want to hear from God. So these scam artists are able to take advantage of them. Man, I'm just, I'm trying to say to you this morning, be careful. Be so careful because the word of God, if you need direction in your life, the word of God is where you need to get direction. Not from a prophet, not from prophecy. Prophets will confirm what God has spoken to you. 
Words of prophecy will come and God will, will say, yes, you're on the right track. But if you need direction for your life, you get direction from the word of God because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction. And what? Instruction in righteousness. That's where you get direction for your life. The word of God. And then the third thing I'm going to share with you as I wrap up this morning. Test all prophecy. Now I'm not going to say too much about this because I've asked Pastor Rodas and, and Prophetess I, Ivy to share some of their teachings out of their prophetic class, insights prophetic class, on how to judge prophecy. And they're going to do that next week. So I would just uh, say this about it as we wrap up this morning. Verse 20 says, do not despise prophecy. And the verse 21 says, test all things. Hold fast what is good. Uh, in the NIV it says, but test them all. Test all the prophecies and hold on to the good ones. The ones that are good. Test them and make sure they're good. And when they are, hold on to them because they will give you hope. Now that's my words, not scripture. But that's what I believe. The word, the prophetic utterance that is brought to you will give you hope that you're on the right track. But make sure, always make sure, one of the, the things that you must line prophecy up with is the word of God. For the word of God is living. Hebrews 4.12. It's living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing division of your soul, your spirit, your joints and marrow. It divides your spirit and soul. Only God can do that. He joined that together. That's who you are, your spirit and soul man, person. He joined that together, but only God can divide it. He divides joints and marrow. He divides your flesh from your spirit and your soul. He discerns, he helps us to discern the thoughts and the intents of our heart. But it's the word of God that does that. Stand with me. You know, when you talk about supernatural in the body of Christ, it's controversial. You know, we have so many churches in our area that just refuse to believe in the supernatural manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, we've been taught that those things are of the devil, and we've been taught all kinds of erroneous teachings that are not a part of the Bible. And yet, we've also seen abuses of those things. Every one of us, if you've been in the body of Christ for very long, you've seen abuses. You've seen abuses of the gifts of the Spirit. You've seen abuses of tongues interpretation. You've seen abuses of prophecy. You've seen people abused through words of wisdom, words of knowledge. And yes, so we want to be very careful. We want to do everything uh, according to the Word of God, decent and in order, so that the manifestation of the Spirit is a true gift that is brought forth to the body of Christ. I desire to see the, the power of God move. We need it more than we've ever needed it before. We need God. We need the Holy Spirit to go forth and touch the hearts of people. People are hurting. People are in need. People have been abused. They've been abused in all kinds of realms and in society. They've been abused by churches. They've been abused by so-called prophets. But that doesn't change the fact that our God is good. Our God is right. Our God teaches us truth from his word. And when we walk according to the word, I love what David says. Your word will hide my heart. 
that I may not or will not sin against you. Hide that word in your heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we trust your word. We trust that your direction, we trust the things that you give us from your word. Help us to operate according to your will. Lord, we don't want to be out of order in anything that we do. We want to be orderly, but we don't want to be so confined to rules and regulations, Lord, that keep us from hearing and operating in your gifts. Open our hearts. Open our minds to the things that you want to do. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to us through your word. And then confirm those things through your supernatural gifts. Thank you, Lord, that you're ministering among your people. And that you promise that you will be with us. You will direct us. And you will keep us, Father, to move according to your will. That your will will be done in this church. Your will will be be done in the, the congregation, in individual lives. Your will will be done to touch people's hearts. Lives will be changed and altered. The enemy will be defeated. He's already a defeated foe. But we'll walk in that victory. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you're watching this morning from online, we just thank you for being a part of this. And remember, uh, love never fails. If you'd like to have prayer.